Good morning, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to see everyone saying good morning to each other in the chat. Welcome to Provoking Faith in the uh, in time of isolation, uh, Bloomsbury's online service, um, and is uh, Valentine's Day. So happy Valentine's Day. You guys are all my Valentines. <laughs> Um, so let us pray. Loving God. Oh, sorry. sorry. We're doing the call to worship first. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Let's do that first. Um, and so please say with me the words in the bold type. Uh, Lord Jesus, Lord of life, Lord of hope, we gather in your name. We hear your call on our lives. Lord Jesus, bringer of comfort, giver of peace, we gather in your name. We hear your call on our lives. Lord Jesus, healer of our wounded souls, we gather in your name. We hear your call on our lives. Lord Jesus, creator of new life, we gather in your name. We hear your call on our lives. Now, we, now we're going to pray. <laughs> Loving God, thank you for this space where our hearts and minds can meet and share in your love and wisdom. This Valentine's Day, we remember that your love is for everyone, regardless of orientation or gender, and that you bless all loving relationships in families and friendships and in partners. This is also Racial Justice Sunday, so we lift up BLM movement to you as we remember that there is so much more work to be done in racial equality around the world and in the UK. So we ask for your guidance, Lord, and we pray the prayer given to us Loving God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So now I think we're going to have some notices. Is that correct? Um, yeah, that's absolutely right. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. So I will let you guys do the notices. Okay. Uh, so first notice is uh, a reminder to people that um, this week we have uh, the committal service and then the uh, service of Thanksgiving and Remembrance for uh, our friend and long-standing member Bill Somerville. The funeral uh, uh, committal service will be at the crematorium 
on uh, Thursday afternoon. Uh, that is a short service of committal in the chapel. Uh, and then on Saturday afternoon, we have uh, online um, a service of thanksgiving and remembrance when we will tell stories and uh, remember and celebrate Bill's life. Um, you can access the committal service online as well, and the details of that are available. I think Jackie's been sending them out and Libby has them as well. So uh, hopefully you've, you've got those links if you want them. The, the service on Saturday will be on the link that you're on now. So if you know how to get into the Sunday service by telephone or by Zoom or by uh, Facebook or however you're accessing us this morning, you'll be able to join us in the same way at 2.30 on Saturday for the service of Thanksgiving and Remembrance. Uh, for Bill Somerville and I would just ask that everybody holds uh, Jackie in your prayers particularly this week uh, as you know it, it, it's it's that week and it's going it's going to be a, a time where she will need to know she is surrounded by love from her church community which which she is. Um, moving on we have some feedback now from uh, Ian Pentney and Libby, who are going to uh, talk to us a little bit about prison ministry. So if I could ask them to uh, unmute and turn on, then I can make sure that they're spotlighted for us all to see. So Ian and Libby, tell us about what's been going on with prison ministry and masks. Can I just um, quickly say um, hi to everybody? Um, and um, as you're well aware, I think, you know, we had a, the, the London Prison uh, uh, Mission Week um, in which we did look at a lot of aspects of um, ministry. And, and, and then we, we had this opportunity to get involved in, in producing masks for, for women in um, one of the prisons that LPM is involved in. Um, and I'm, I'm going to read to you um, um, an email that, uh, that we had from um, Simeon Sterney, who's uh, he's a through-the-gate um, chaplain at um, Barnesfield um, women's prison. Okay, so he says, um, and he's writing to one of the people on the LM board, um, dear uh, Joanna Sh uh, Ship. So, dear Joanna, would you please send my thanks to the sewers from Bloomsbury Central Baptist Church for the wonderful masks? The masks serve two purposes. One, they support the women being released to comply with national guidelines regarding traveling on public transport and entering shops, etc. Two, they remind the women that they are not forgotten um, and are so valuable that people can give up their time and energy to support them. Currently, point two is more significant than perhaps the sewers appreciate. At present, all prisoners in every establishment are given fabric masks introduced at the end of last year. They are plain in colour and mass produced. In my prison, the women draw on their masks to make them personalised. However, the masks made by the sewers are off, obviously individually made and the colors are in some cases and, and designs are unique. When I walk with a woman to the station, I offer them one of these masks and in most cases they are readily accepted because they are different. They are so used to being uniform. Therefore standing out being different is a good thing. I recently gave an orange mask and the woman loved it as it was bright and cheery. This is great for a woman's self-esteem too. She feels valued and appreciated. And so often asks me to thank the person who made it. So please pass on their thanks to all those who have been involved in the mask making project. Should anyone ask if there is a need for more masks, given that prisons are now, now, now provide fabric uh, masks, sorry, now that prisons now provide fabric masks, my, sim my answer is simple. Yes, please. I'm in the fortunate position to see the joy a simple handmade mask can bring to someone who feels so undeserving of care and attention. Once again, thank you um, and all of those involved in the mask project. So project. So yeah, thank you so much for everybody who made the mask and sort of over to Libby really, because uh, I think there's a sort of onward movement with it, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you to, to Hazel and Sarah and Roseanne and Denise, uh, Luke's mum, for helping to make the 24 masks that we made uh, during, I think, second lockdown. Um, for me, uh, this whole project has opened up a way into thinking about women in prison 
it's not something that I'm particularly comfortable with uh, in terms of that project or that world. And I found that this was a practical way of maybe supporting something that I couldn't support in, in many other ways. So I would like for us to continue this uh, project. Um, so if anybody wants to continue to support it and make masks, um, it will have to be on our own kind of setup. So we won't be using the lovely kits that came from Joanne, Joanna's ship. Uh, we'll, we'll work with uh, Simeon to see what he requires and, and how we can forward this and, and keep contact with the, the London prison mission in a way that feels right for us at this moment. So thank you everyone. Uh, let me know in the chat if you do want to continue to help or become a new sewer, not a sewer. I know the <laughs> church secretary has had a lovely time on, on Facebook <laughs> calling us all sewers and not sewers. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but the word, there are other words that seem rather rather old fashioned to you. So we'll continue to use sewers and give everybody a smile. But thank you, everybody. Uh, thanks, Libby. And just to say, um, I'm, you know, Solomon um, has been involved in, in um, LPM as a, a you know, a, a sort of connection with, uh, with from Bloomsbury for, for a long time. So, you know, we, we, there's already a team, you know, and Simon has great relationship with them. Um, and I, I've kind of recently come into it. And so this, and what's really interesting and I think exciting for me is that when I've been attending um, the sort of regular meetings on, you know, on Zoom, um, this seemingly small thing has actually been significant in encouraging, um, you know, the, the people uh, of LPM, because I think it's a difficult, difficult time. And, they, you know, they're, they're stuck. They're not able to really help in a way, you know, um, no prison visiting. And, and honestly, I, I've just been urged by John Plummer, who was a brilliant guy who headed up, that, you know, the situation in prisons um, right across the country is dire. You know, um, he wants to, us to emphasize that, you know, that people are, are you know, if, if we think lockdown is bad, <laughs> you know, real lockdown is bad um, at this time. So just to say thank you ever so much. You've been a real encouragement. And let, let's just carry on. Yeah, Thanks. great. Thank you. A uh, huge thank you then to all our sewers. I see there's suggestions of other other uh, words that might be used. We've had needle persons and sewists. Uh, we could extend that one to sew easters possibly. Um, just to say in terms of London Prison Ministry, this is uh, an offshoot uh, ministry, a spun off ministry from Churches Together in Westminster. So Bloomsbury's had an involvement in it for a long time. Some of you will remember uh, what we called the gallery in the gallery, where we had uh, used our gallery to host an arts project uh, of artwork done by um, serving prisoners. So, you know, this, this is really great that we're able to continue um, having a, this practical involvement with the London Prison Ministry. And I'm grateful to Libby, all the sewers, to Ian and to Solomon for keeping the ball rolling. And I also noticed that there are a number of volunteers of people uh, in the chat. So uh, Libby, please uh, take a note of those and follow that up. Uh, okay, a couple of uh, other things I want to draw attention to. It's, it's a bumper notices slot today. Um, if you're up for a Lent challenge or some Lent involvement, uh, you, you may be I know, giving up uh, chocolate or alcohol or something. Uh, I mean, there's not much point in me giving up chocolate because I barely eat it uh, and I'm certainly not giving up alcohol. But you might want to give up a bit of time for uh, something to um, as a discipline during Lent. And a couple of things. First of all, at Bloomsbury, we're going to be running um, Lent and Art Group on Sundays through Lent. So starting next week, 4.30 to 6 o'clock. Um, and the link to register for this is on our website. And the link to get to the website to find it is in the chat. Um, and uh, this is following on from the success that we had with an Advent art project uh, when we did uh, looking at Advent, looking at art through Advent, using the resources of the visual commentary on scripture, which has come out of King's College London, put together by a couple of friends of mine. It's just the most fantastic website. And uh, you don't need to be an expert in art to come and uh, give some time to letting art speak to you uh, in dialogue with scripture and themes as we approach the cross 
and Easter. So that's uh, the first one of those. The second is slightly more demanding. Uh, and I'm, again, I'm putting the link in the chat for you here. Uh, I'm one of the trustees of the Christian Inquiry Agency, which is a uh, a spin-off from Churches Together in England, and it runs the website christianity.org.uk. And for Lent this year, we're uh, putting together a Lent Bible tour challenge. Um, my friend Helen Painter, who's tutor in biblical studies at Bristol Baptist College, her, her lockdown project last in the first part of last year was every day she recorded a little video introducing another book of the Bible and some books needed a couple of videos. And we've ended up with 80 videos, which rather nicely divides into two per day through Lent. So the challenge is get to know the whole of the Bible through Lent, doing a video in the morning and a video in the evening. Of course, if you don't finish it through Lent, then it'll still be there and you can catch up as you make your way towards the summer. But I do commend these to you. If you've always thought, you know, I wish I knew more about the Bible. This is the best way of just opening your eyes to some of those bits that you may never have read or thought about. So I'll leave that one with you. Uh, and again, the link's in the chat. And uh, I'm going to ask Solomon now if he would turn on his camera and video and then we can spotlight Solomon so that we can all see him. Uh, Solomon, uh, you came along on Wednesday evening for the first of our new Wednesday evening studies in our anti-racism series. Um, we looked to, we listened to a bit of Martin Luther King. Uh, just love to know what your thoughts were after Wednesday evening. Thank you, Simon. Well, Dr. Martin Luther King uh, sermon on the Paul letter to the American Christian. Actually, uh, for me, it's a, a literary uh, fiction uh, to address the real questions during the, the the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. But interestingly, uh, 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 Tommaso uh, helped us with a, a two major, uh, a two two part exploratory uh, introduction to reflect on uh, compar comparable political, economic, and social and religious issues at the time uh, uh, in America. But I, I say that advanced through significant achievements actually and uh, in post-Second post World War uh, economic prosperity. And actually uh, there was also a big social, social change as uh, Tomas have explained. And, and the confrontation was the unresolved issue about race in America. And we were, all, all, were also able to dive through uh, aspects of segregation, church affiliation, worship, and how culture of black and white fellowship uh, has a huge influence on the understanding of race, particularly uh, in relation to how Dr. King was keen to attract uh, all groups of American society and the struggle towards racial and economic justice. And remarkably, remarkably the issue of race, as I've learned uh, uh, last Wednesday, uh, 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 and, and the content of that the King uh, letter to the American Christian have, have followed us more than 60 years later, um, and we shall provoke yet another un unanswered question in contemporary American politics in the wake of Black Lives matters protests around the world over to you simon great thanks ever so much solomon so this was the beginning of a series that's going to run through a large chunk of this year we meet every other week on wednesday evenings uh, we're building on the gospel music series where duncan uh, was introducing us to um, a, a lot of the themes of uh, that emerged from the gospel music tradition uh, and now we're, we're going to be hearing one one week a month, we're going to be hearing from a, a significant black voice. So some of them will be Martin Luther King and we'll listen to some more excerpts from his sermons. But we'll also be making sure that we have other voices heard in there as well. And uh, then on the alternating uh, Wednesday of each month, because um, we're doing a two week rotation, uh, we're going to be doing a book group, reading through a, a fantastic book, which is, uh, came out a couple of years ago. Um, called uh, by Ben Lindsay called uh, We Need to Talk About Race. And on the 24th, we're going to be talking about the first chapter from this book. Uh, is it because I'm black is the title of the first chapter. So you can get the book on Amazon, you can get it at Kindle or you can get it in paperback. And if you don't want to use Amazon, of course, other independent booksellers are available. So uh, if you're interested in joining that discussion, um, 
it would be better if you've read the chapter. It's not long. It's kind of a half hour, 45 minute read. Um, it'd be better if you've read the chapter. But if you haven't read the chapter, you can still come and I'm sure you'll get something from the discussion. Um, but yeah, so that's on the 24th, the next one. And we're beginning our anti-racism book group there. Thanks, Solomon. Uh, we're, Solomon's going to be coming back later in the service with the uh, panel and helping me lead the prayers of intercession. But for now, uh, where are we at in our notices? I've done all the notices. Uh, back to Fifi. Wow, there's like so much stuff going on and it's so exciting. It's so wonderful to see Libby. I'm also volunteering to sew masks. I think that's really beautiful what you guys are doing. Um, and yeah, it's just so exciting that we've got so much stuff happening. Even though we can't meet, um, we're still getting together in so many ways. It's like really wonderful to see. Um, now that we have ingested all that information, we are going to have um, our first Bible reading from Nikwith. Morning. I'll be reading Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 to 35. Moses came down from Mount Sinai. As he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin on his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron and the, all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him and he gave them in commandment all, the, all that the Lord has spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses that the skin on his face was shining and Moses would put a veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. Well, thank you very much, Nicholas. And now we're going to have um, our first hymn, oh, Praise My Soul, King of Heaven. Yeah. 
lovely. Okay, now we're going to have Nikwith with the second part of our Bible reading. I'll be now reading Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 43. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance on his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speak, sorry. Yes, they appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said, while he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, this is my son, my chosen, listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone and they kept silent and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they, came, when they had to come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then, a man, from, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly, a spirit seizes him, and all at once he streaks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It molds him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation. How much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him out in the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. Thank you very much for that, Nick with. We're now going to have our sermonette. Um, do please share any thoughts or um, any questions you have in the chat. Um, it's always wonderful to hear what you guys need to think, but um, now over to Simon. Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you, Nikwis. Controversies about face coverings are not simply a COVID-19 phenomena. And whilst I must confess to finding the politicised reluctance to wear a mask in the interests of public safety as mystifying as the trend to wear masks on the chin or under the nose, nonetheless, arguments about whether to cover one's face are nothing new. The controversial French law of 2011 made it illegal to wear a face covering veil or any other mask in public places. And this led the United Nations Human Rights Committee to declare in 2018 that France's ban disproportionately harmed the right of women to manifest their religious beliefs and could have the effect of confining them to their homes, impeding their access to public services and marginalising them. And the irony is not lost on me that it was in August last year that Paris became one of the first places to make wearing a mask in public compulsory. My how things change when the needs change. But of course, face and head coverings can also be highly oppressive, symbols of a patriarchy that excludes women from functioning fully within society as equals. So from Covid face masks to religious head coverings, the issue of whether or not to conceal one's face remains a contentious issue and frequently becomes indicative of a clash between the demands of religious practice or ideological position and the requirements of civil society. 
to mask or not to mask? Well, this is probably a good point to take a trip back in time uh, to a far earlier discussion around uh, veiling the face. Uh, we're going to go back in time now uh, some thousands of years to Moses coming down from Mount Sinai with the two st stone tablets containing the Ten Commandments. Whilst up the mountain, we're told that Moses had been talking face to face with God. And then when he came down from the mountain, his face was shining with the glory of God. But after giving the commandments of God to the people, Moses then had to put on a face veil because we are told the people were afraid. The significance of this is that at the very moment of the giving of the law, which was intended to show people how to relate to one another and to God, we find not unity, but fear and division. Rather than bringing people together, the revelation of the laws through Moses instead brought social disruption as Moses was veiled from his fellow Israelites and spiritual disruption as the manifest presence of God was veiled from the people of God. It can be hard to make sense of Moses' experience, but I think Victor Hugo gets close in the book Les Miserables, where he describes the old bishop, Monsignor Bienvenu, with the words, he did not study God, he was dazzled by God. And I think this contrast between studying God and being dazzled by God is helpful to us as we contrast the differing responses of Moses and the people of Israel of old. The Israelites focused on the tablets of the law, which they made their object of study, whilst Moses focused on the brightness of the revelation of the God who gave the law. And here we have the heart of the problem. Religious people through the ages, from the people of Israel at Mount Sinai to Christians of the contemporary era, religious people have persisted in finding themselves much less troubled when they have a law to keep and apply. Whilst those whose faces reflect their encounter with the divine are feared and segregated and veiled off from society. In the sociology of religion, it is often the case that things are originally declared taboo because they are considered too holy, but that those things declared taboo eventually come to be reviled as unclean. And one might note here that those men who find their study of religious law requires them to enforce restrictive legislation on women, they might believe they're acting out of a desire for careful observance of the commands of God, but the tragedy is that the glory of the gift of a fully equal humanity becomes veiled as they do so, and human society as God intends it becomes segregated, becoming in the process so much less than it could and should be. The law of Moses, which should have provided the mechanism for genuine and open relationship between people and between people and their God, became instead an excuse for segregation, division and distrust. So the two stone tablets with the Ten Commandments on were placed in the Ark of the Covenant which was then placed in the Holy of Holies in time at the heart of the Jewish temple, separated from the people by, yes, you've guessed it, a veil in the temple. And only the high priest could go beyond the veil into the Holy of Holies, and then only once a year on the Day of Atonement. That which was holy and given as a gift of grace from God became taboo because it was so holy and in time it became untouchable, something to be avoided by almost everyone. And if we fast forward through time a few centuries, we come to another prophet ascending a mountain for a face-to-face -face encounter with the divine. 
Jesus goes up the mountain to pray with three of his disciples. And whilst he's there, he has an experience which is analogous to that of Moses. Luke's gospel tells us that whilst he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. It's no accident that this imagery echoes that of Moses. Luke is clearly telling us that Jesus is a prophet like Moses. In fact, he's telling us more than that. The way Luke sees Jesus, Jesus is the new Moses, bringing into being a new covenant between God and humanity, predicated not on the giving of stone tablets inscribed with the commandments of the law, but on a direct revelation of God himself, revealed through the person of Jesus Christ. To hammer this point home, we discover that Jesus is now mysteriously accompanied on the mountain by none other than Moses himself together with the prophet Elijah. Here we have the great symbolic representative individuals of the law, Moses, and the prophets, Elijah, accompanying Jesus at the moment of his face-to-face -face encounter with God. And then just when we think it couldn't get any more apocalyptic, we have a cloud and a disembodied voice speaking from the cloud. And those of us who know the Exodus story will recognise this imagery. The cloud is the cloudy, fiery pillar which led the people of Israel from slavery through the wilderness of sin to freedom in the promised land. And the voice is the same divine voice that dictated the commands of the law to Moses. But this time, rather than speaking words of law, the voice from heaven offers only one command. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. This is the new law given to the new Moses in fulfilment of the law and prophets. This is the new law which will lead those who keep it safely through the wilderness from slavery to sin and death and into the promised land of the dawning kingdom of God. It is this new law which completes and fulfills the old law. And this law, this new law is written not on stone tablets, but is embodied in the living person of Jesus Christ. Those who want to know how to live according to the new law need study no longer the words of the commandments. Instead, they need to be dazzled by an encounter with God in Christ. And I have a question for all of us, for me and for you. Are you dazzled by your encounter with God in Christ? And so Jesus, the new Moses, the personification of the new law comes down from the mountain, just as Moses came down from the mountain in Sinai. And this is where it gets interesting. Moses, as we have seen, had to veil his face because people were afraid. Jesus, on the other hand, comes down the mountain to encounter a, te a terrifying spirit, which is causing a young child to shriek and convulse and foam at the mouth. The symptoms that Luke describes of the young man's illness closely match those of epilepsy. And indeed, in the parallel account in Matthew's Gospel, he is described as an epileptic. And whilst modern medicine has a better understanding of this condition and how it can be controlled, the result of a violent epileptic fit is as terrifying today as it has ever been, and clearly this young man's life was subject to forces of chaos beyond his or anyone else's ability to control. It turns out that the disciples have been attempting to play exorcist and have been trying unsuccessfully to heal the boy by casting out a disruptive spirit. What Jesus says next is significant. The unspoken Oh, for goodness sake, is almost tangible. As he mutters despairingly, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Before commanding the father to bring the young boy to him. The healing is then straightforward as Jesus rebukes the spirit and brings peace to the convulsing child before restoring him back to his father. It seems the reason the disciples have been unable to heal the child was because they were part of this, what Jesus calls, faithless and perverse generation. They belonged to the latest of the many generations which had encountered God with veiled minds. 
they had not faced the dazzling and transforming character of God with unveiled faces, but instead had been shaped by a religion which focused on the study of the law and the application of its commandments. The healing of this young man, like so many of the healing stories in the Gospels, is not primarily about the physical cure, although there is certainly a physical element to what happens. Rather, it is a story about the restoration of the young man to his rightful place in society. We're told that after his healing, he is restored back to his father, back to his family, back to his place in society. Epileptics in those days were greatly feared as well as pitied because they were believed to be inhabited by demons which caused their fits. And so they and others with similar conditions were kept at the margins of society, hidden away and out of sight, veiled off from the rest of the population. An epileptic was an all too real reminder of the chaos that was believed to lurk just below the surface of the world, threatening to break through and overwhelm people at any moment. The disciples had been unable to heal him, unable to restore him to society, because their minds were still veiled. They were focusing simply on a spiritual cause for a physical manifestation of sickness. But when the epileptic boy was brought to Jesus, he encountered this new Moses with an unveiled face, and rather than pity or fear or a desire to problem solve, he simply met in Jesus, the God who restores equality between humans, who brings healing to society and restoration to those who are cast aside or curtained off. The healing of the young man was not just a spiritual act, it was not just a physical act, it was a social act, restoring him to his family. And it was a political act, challenging the structures of society that had acted to segregate him away. And in this healing of the young man, we see the implications of what it means to encounter God in Christ with unveiled faces. The faithless and perverse generation is one which is beset by demons of all kinds, demons which divide us from one another, sowing seeds of chaos and confusion, disorder and disruption. And I'm sure we could, if we wanted, name some of the demons of division in our own culture. Today is Racial Justice Sunday and the evils of racism have been laid bare for us over the course of the last year with the Black Lives Matter movement calling us to a better vision of humanity. And from racism to sexism to homophobia, biphobia and transphobia, the evils of exclusion and division are all around us. As God's good creation becomes distorted and humanity is disrupted. The faithless and perverse generation still has veiled minds, looking for mechanistic solutions to presenting problems. The faithless and perverse generation can study law till kingdom come and be none the wiser about the path to freedom. But those who encounter God in Christ with unveiled faces are called to be those who bring holistic healing to a world that remains frustratingly fragmented. The call is upon all of us to keep the veils from our own faces, even if we have to mask in the interests of public safety. As we, with Christ, descend from the mountain of revelation, the call is upon each of us to resist those forms of religion which perpetuate us and them mentalities, which seek to, seek to veil person from person, keeping our own revelation of divine love veiled from others. If in Christ we have received the law of the Spirit of Christ, who is given to bring healing, restoration and renewal, then our task is to allow that revelation to shine into the whole world, to illuminate the darkest places, to bring healing to the most troubled and chaotic souls. We are all too adept 
at finding effective ways of dividing our own community one from another along grounds of ethnicity, social standing, gender and sexuality. And when we do so, we not only divide the body of Christ, we also place a veil over the whole church in such a way as to conceal the light we have from those who most need its revelation. Those who meet the world with unveiled faces are called to be those who see the structures and systems in society which exclude the weak and the vulnerable, which diminish and demean the oppressed, which stigmatise the demented and segregate the unfamiliar. Those who encounter the world with unveiled faces are called to bring healing, restoring, transforming presence of Christ to those whom others have written off as irredeemable. The veil between God and humanity was ripped in two at the moment of the crucifixion. The veil which lies over the hearts of humans is swept aside in Christ. As none other than Paul himself puts it, and I will close with this quote from 2 Corinthians, all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, from the Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, Simon, for the sermonette. Um, after, we're going to have a little moment of silence um, and then we will lead on to our discussion. Please keep chatting in the chat and tell me all of you uh, what you guys thought. Um, that would be really wonderful. Um, but yeah, let's just have a little moment of silence. I'm going to ask all the panelists to unmute and uh, switch your cam ons, please. Um, but yeah, let's just take a moment. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, does anyone have any initial thoughts that they want to share uh, with the group? I feel really dazzled. <laughs> it's like being having been up on a mountain, actually, that, that whole, you know, um, what Simon shared with us. So that's kind of how I'm feeling, really. I think so much in that you know, that's really wonderful and challenging. Uh, yeah, so that's where I'm at. I think being dazzled, that stands out. And uh, what the comment about, you know, um, in a way that, you know, fr from that, that brilliant quote from um, Les Mis, you know, about studying, they didn't study God, he was dazzled by God. I think that stands out. And I think um, God is dazzled by us. I was writing <laughs> Nothing is like greater than God's creation and being unveiled and wow. us being unveiled and being true to who we are and being completely oh, ourselves um, oh, is uh, is beautiful. Mm. Yeah, that's, like, fantastic. Mm. Thank you, Nicholas. That is really beautiful. I love that. That God is also like, whoa, look at you. <laughs> yeah, I just, I mean, my my thoughts. Um, we're just more on the kind of separation of like thinking about back when things were like veiled and like how that is kind of still happening like it happened in the way that the bible was only in latin to try and like put a veil there between um people and the bible um and even now like with some people like you know you saying that only the Pope can speak to God and stuff like that. There is like um, exclusion and segregation, like even within Christianity then. 
um, I was just thinking about that. To be dazzled is to know that you can also go to the Ark of the Covenant and get a shiny face. This is what I was thinking. Um, would anyone else like to share? Nigel, I'll pick on you. Cause <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was thinking really of the, uh, those words, you know, this is my son, listen to him. And how when we don't listen to Christ, we end up listening to each other sometimes and we start making up our rules and regulations and deciding who's in and who's out and how we decide who's in and who's out. Whereas Christ always was radical in his inclusion of people in the way he spoke with people that society cast aside. He, he, he touched the woman with an issue, she's called. He, he touched the lepers. He, he spoke to everyone. He, he spoke to the woman, in, uh, you know, the woman who was accused of adultery. All these people that nice society and the religious authorities decided were excluded, he included. And I think, you know, if we're gonna, if we're gonna listen to Christ, that's what we have to do. And we need to think about who, who are we not being so welcome into? And it, even in our church, are the people or types of people we are less welcome into, that we, we don't touch and welcome in. I think, the, you know, listen to him, God said, and I think that's good mm. advice for us. Mm. Well, thank yeah. you. Yeah, very powerful. We're thinking mm. about this. Yeah. When we just step in, uh, for me, I, what I take from, um, from the sermonette is, I think uh, true wisdom actually comes from the word of God. And I personally um, uh, uh, took some time to understand an issue about race and to um, about inequality and uh, social justice issues. And if somebody had a discussion with me a couple of years ago, say, well, 90% of black people uh, don't know what race is and the fact that you only think that well race is basically the white dislike for blacks which is well um i, I would say a, a, a meaningless uh, 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 definition of what race is but then i you look at the inequality you look at social justice and i come to the understanding that, well, this relationship, it's a competitive relationship that we have with one another and um, and wish the advantage, the ultimate advantage is to make other more powerful uh, politically and economically. And what I got from this teaching as, as a wisdom point for me is uh, the, the, the failed issue. I think, um, covering the face and then imposing laws on people is, is an aspect of, of, of creating a kind of uh, a competitive relationship with someone of, of anybody that is oppressed and to, uh, to, the, yeah, to gain maybe an, an advantage and to make people excluded instead of making people included. Um, uh, that's that's the that's a big thing I, I I got from this summit from Simon basically. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, we have some things from the chat that's coming through. Uh, as I really like um oh gosh I really like what uh. Um, I believe Jeff said, oh, um, trying to see who said what. Um, yeah, so I really like that Jeff said, listen and be inspired, not listen and be told. And really feeling dazzled is, gets me very excited. So um, <laughs> I like that. I really like that. Um, we have also some questions here from... Carolyn, she is saying sometimes it feels like talking about a salmon leads people back into the veiled place where what could follow a salmon is like an 
act or a direct demonstration of love and um or even vulnerability I think it's kind of like I guess what kind of Nigel was saying about people listening to people instead of people listening to God um but still I think it's important that we are like sharing um like amongst each other but just always remember that ultimately we are going to listen listen to Jesus um but yeah thank you that she's she's really enjoying the reflections today and finding it easy to feel in my heart which is a really special too um so yeah thank you guys keep chatting keep chatting away um and uh yeah what's next on the list now sure next up we have a hymn lovely um so yeah we're gonna have our hymn now um uh, praise my soul the king of heaven or no wait another another hymn oh it's down here our god our help there we go <laughs> to hear everyone's voices um so yeah thank you for everyone who was involved in the hymn we are now going to have our prayers of intercession with solomon and simon let us pray loving and forgiving god we come to you today recognizing that in matters of ethnicity we have no choice we are who we have been made to be before you, we rejoice at our diversity and our hearts lift at your great vision of a worshipping multitude gathered from every nation, tribe, people and language. But nonetheless, we recognise that our present reality is very far from this ideal. 
we have each of us been shaped by different forces. Some of us have been ground down, whilst others have been built up. Some of us have been worn away or have become fractured and broken. Some of us have found life a burden rather than a joy. None of us have experienced the perfect life. Some of us have inherited power. Wise others of us have inherited powerlessness. Some of us have been born white in a world where whiteness confers privilege. Others of us have been born black in a world where dark skin carries disadvantage. We know that this is not the world as you would have it be, but it is our world and it has been our experience. None of us ask for our skin color. None of us ask to be born the hairs of oppression. None of us ask to inherit power or powerlessness. So before you and in the name of Jesus Christ, who loves all people equally, regardless of ethnicity, gender or social status, we come now to recommit ourselves to your vision of the world. We come now to pray your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven and to offer ourselves once to live out your coming kingdom of it equality and justice in our lives, in our churches and in our communities. And so we confess our own complicity in the status quo, which divides and distorts humanity. As we pray, we ask that you will release us from guilt and will help us to find ways of laying down the burdens we have inherited. Help us to discover our true and rightful place within the new humanity created in Jesus Christ. All races together, we confess that we have sinned and that we have fallen short of the glory of God. We confess our failures to speak out against injustice. We confess those times when as individuals and churches, we have witnessed the fracturing of humanity along ethnic grounds and yet have remained silent. We confess those times when we have been the powerful ones and have chosen to withhold that power whilst another human suffered. We confess the sin of racist exclusion, the abuse of power to oppress and demean. May those of us who have ourselves experienced exclusion be the first to speak up for others. May we create spaces for reconciliation. We pray for our churches. May they become places of reconciliation where each human soul is valued and where equality in Christ is a reality in our midst. Forgive us those times where we do not live out our calling as your people. And may our church at Bloomsbury model the new humanity of Christ to those in the communities where those of us who attend live. We pray for our communities where there is division. May we bring restoration where there is inequality, may we bring justice. Where there is powerlessness, may we lift up the broken hearted. Where there is damage, May we bring healing. Loving and forgiving God, hear our confession. Hear the desires of our hearts to be different. Grant us your forgiveness and remake us according to the likeness of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Solomon. That's a very powerful prayer and it was so wonderful to have both your voices um, speaking in it. Um, I'm now going to pray for the offering, which as we know, there isn't like a little ball going around, but 
some people have been um, able to give through bank transfer and even giving through time um, and things like that is is a very important too. So I'm going to be praying for that. Um, Lord, we lift up these gifts to you that have been given to us this past week, be it monetary or through time or through um, any effort put towards the church. Use it to guide us to a more inclusive and um, more like your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us. And thank you for everyone who has contributed. Um, even if it is just by saying hi in the chat, Everyone shows their gifts in different ways. Amen. And before you guys leave, please allow me to bless you. May the Lord bless you, keep you and treat you this week. And know uh, your love, his love, her love with you. Amen. Thank you.